do, and I wasn't being congruent. So it's a, the testament today is this works because I screwed it up royally, royally in the beginning. And then I finally started to apply the system that I now teach business owners over and over and over again, and I watched them succeed the way I succeeded. I started to write I am statements, and I had this big thing that said, I am a top 100 coach. And at that time, I probably ranked about 2,000 in, in the list of coaches. But within a year and a half, I was a top 100 coach globally, not in the US. I was top 15 in the United States out of all the coaches because I took the systems and the processes and the things that you have to do to consciously think about not doing what you're good at, not being the best CPA or the best um, plumber or the best whatever it is that you do or sell, but you have to be the best at business. And that's the part that we don't think about when we're starting, because all I wanted to do was coach and help people, but I wasn't building the business that allowed me to do that. So today we're gonna walk you through exactly how to not do what I did. <laughs> And hopefully we've gotten to you early enough that you won't ever have to experience that. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Action Coach, but before I do that, I want to first thank Bank OZK for organizing this with me and giving us their use of this amazing space. And, um, you know, I have a client who's in the process of applying for an SBA loan with another bank. And so yesterday I had her on the phone and I actually had the other bank on the phone and they were telling me a whole bunch of things that they thought could be problems instead of what they thought could be solutions. And I picked up the phone and I called Bank OZK. And the very first thing that Dottie said to me is, we can get really creative in how we help business owners. And so that's my testament to Bank OZK. They really are here for small business. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Josh to just in two minutes or so, tell us a little bit about Bank OZK, how you got started and why you're here. All right. Uh, so my name is Josh Haynes, and I am a commercial banker here in our Winston office. Uh, and sort of a, a real short history of our, our uh, bank is we came to this area through uh, an acquisition for, uh, through a bank called Bank of the Carolinas, and that's where I worked prior to. So we had 10 branches in this area uh, when, when we were acquired by, it was Bank of the Ozarks at the time, uh, we had eight branches. So that's how we landed here in Winston-Salem. We've been in this building since July. I think 23rd was the day we moved in. Uh, so we've been here a little bit longer than a month. Pr previously, we were over by uh, where Toys R Us was. Um, and uh, the rebrand is Bank OZK now. OZK doesn't really stand for anything. We were talking about that uh, a few minutes ago. But uh, the bank is headquartered in Little Rock, Arkansas. We're about a $20 billion bank. So think BB&T in 1985. That's about how big <laughs> we are now uh, and growing. But uh, we're, we're happy to be here, uh, and the, the OZK just came about because Bank of the Ozarks, uh, we wanted the bank to sound less regional because we do have a lot of branches in North Carolina, uh, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, places like that, that where the Ozarks aren't in your backyard. So uh, Bank OZK is the hip, cool name that we came up you with. You know, we're <laughs> really good at coming up yeah. with acronyms. We might Absolutely. have to come you up with, come a, up good, with something, yeah. a good acronym. Right. Well, thank so you. that's the two-minute version. And a little bit about us, a little bit about Action Coach. Oh, I went the wrong way. So we are the number one business coaching firm in the world. Um, it was started 25 years ago by a gentleman by the name of Brad Sugars when he was 19. Today we are in, there's a thousand coaching offices, probably about two to 3,000 coaches. Um, we're in 82 countries. The really cool thing is we have resources 82 countries deep. If I want to know what's going on with systems or processes in your industry, I can tap into 15 or 16 other coaches to find out what's the best software to use, what's the best. So some of it is education and training. A lot of it is accountability. But we've got a combination of both. Um, we have this vision, and it's to create world abundance through business re-education. Now, I probably can't affect the world, but my vision is world abundance as it relates to the triad. If I can help the business owners in the triad be more successful, and I can get every single one of the small businesses in this room to a point where they have to hire five more employees, you've made a bigger impact than some of these big brands that come into our community and get the front page of the business journal because you are the ones that are hiring more people than any of those. And you're struggling to do it 
and you, you're creating an environment where people actually like to work as opposed to corporate America. So to me, when small businesses can be abundant, abundant in money, making the money that they need to make, and so many people are um, shy of money. They have these thoughts about money planted in their head. Money is the root of? You know what? It's really good to make money because you can't be philanthropic if you don't make money. You know, one of our clients said, you know, we have a dream builder, and I actually <laughs> heard that there were some comments about, this is really like crazy. I don't care what color car I have, and I'm never going to own a helicopter. But he, in his dream builder, said, I want to put a parking lot in for my church. We have a dirt parking lot, and the women come in in their sandals every Sunday, and they're always complaining about the parking lot. When he put that parking lot in, do you think there was a celebration? Would a big corporation want to build a parking lot for their church? I don't know. Maybe they would. I'm hoping that they're getting more enlightened as, <laughs> as they get some of this bad press. Um, over the last two years, um, this firm has ranked in the global top 100 coaches in the world. And more importantly, our coaches, our, our clients, have now become award winners. We have something called um, the Biz X Awards that is sponsored nationally. And many of our clients go, and you don't have to be a client. You can apply for an award and go, and then you can get the status of best manufacturer in the, in the nation. Or, And what it really is, is a um, Academy Awards for small business. Because in every other industry, they have their national sales meeting, they have a gala, people dress up. Small businesses don't get that. So we have this amazing event that happens every year, and um, our clients come, and clients from Greensboro have won. I had a client here that won Best Manufacturer after working with us for two years. Um, the woman who owns Pure Bar, and you'll see a slide on her, she won the award for um, Best Small Business, I think under 20 employees nationally and she had um oh help me who was the guy that gave her award winston churchill's grandson mm -hmm. presented her award and she had french bulldogs and he did and she is now friends and emails back and forth with winston churchill's grandson i think that's pretty cool <laughs> so um when you when you can look at your business not just as your little entity which by the way gets really lonely when you're a small business owner and you're even if you have a team, there's things you don't want to say to your team. There's often things you don't want to say to your spouse, especially when things aren't going great. Sometimes so, not even to yourself. Sometimes not even to yourself, absolutely. So um, making sure that you approach business in a community way. And so part of the benefits of being with Action Coach is you don't just get a coach. You don't just get the education. You don't just get to build your business. You get to be part of a community that is about honesty, because when you go to a networking event, you walk in, how are you? Things are great, I am so busy. And then I'm gonna tell you guys, we look behind the curtains of a lot of those, and they're not. So when you walk into an action coach event, we say, we're gonna drop the kimono. This is where I'm broken. This is where I need help. This is where I'm struggling. So when you come to a networking event with us, whether it's Taco Tuesday at seven o'clock in the morning once a month, it's a place where you can come and say, you know, I'm being a really bad manager. I, you know, I have, I, I finally hired my first person and I don't know how to, you know, coach them. Or it's where, and you don't just get the advice from coaches, you get the advice from other people who are your colleagues in, in the room. So um, I'm really proud of what Action Coach does and I'm, I hope that you see value for the hour you spend today. Um, my other big thing is I am now on Forbes Coaches Council and so I get to contribute to articles that go into Forbes, um, Forbes Magazine, which I think um, so can I be your coach for the next hour, hour and a half? Now at this time I usually close the door, but I'm a little warm, so I'm going to leave the door open. So the whole reason we're here is to, to help you, to educate you, to make your business better. So increase sales and profits. Anybody want to increase their sales and profits? A few? Okay. Um, how about free up your time? Is time management a problem for some of us? And how about create an amazing team? The minute you can start to create the dream team, you will become a business owner. How many here are self-employed and not a business owner? You have a business, but you have to do the marketing, you have to do the finances, you have to sweep the floor, you have to find, <laughs> right? That's self-employed. And what we do is we teach you how to go from self-employed to owning a business. 
that can run without you. That's when you're really a business owner. So we're going to show you the steps and um, hopefully that you get a, a little bit of um, inspiration. And we're going to see if by the end, I might even do a little quiz at the end to see what was the most important thing you learned. So pay attention. I might put you on the spot. So a little bit about learning. First, when it comes to learning, what does the left brain do? It controls the right. What else? Analytical. Yep, analytical. I always remember by logic, the left brain, ooh, the left brain is words, math, logic, process. So if I were to coach an engineering firm, they're usually pretty good at that. If the right brain then is the opposite, it's art and music and creativity and emotion and feelings and expressing yourself, most of the engineers most, I say, are not so good at that side. Anybody here have a feeling you couldn't put into words? Ever? The women will usually admit it, the guys won't, but we know <laughs> you do, right? So when you learn, if your left brain and right brain are in conflict, it's confusing. So you have a pen in front of you. Oh, that's an exercise. You have a pen in front of you. It's got four colors on it. As you take notes, I want you to switch the color ink, maybe as topics change. I want you to um, draw pictures. When we're in school, teacher said, don't doodle, stop the doodling, write your notes. I'm gonna say, doodle. If there's a picture that's gonna make you remember something you learned today, draw that picture down. Because words are really short-term memory. But the minute you can apply some creativity to those words, and some art to those words, you will remember those words way longer. Um, raise your hand while I'm talking. If you, if everybody raise your hand. Can you raise your hand? Woo, yes, you can all do it. So when I say something and it sounds like it's resonating, raise your hand. Let us know that, yeah, that makes sense. Now, if you want me to have your attention, raise it really high, but if you just give me a little, I know that what I'm saying is resonating with you. So I'm gonna do a little bit of a fun exercise. And does this have a point around it, honey? Yes, yeah, three seconds. Okay, so we're gonna... It doesn't work on a screen. It doesn't work on a screen, mm -hmm. okay. So I just want you to read out loud. Red, Red blue, gray, brown, pink, black, black green, purple, yellow, yellow red, red, orange, green, orange. Now, I just want you to call out the colors and not the word. So what that says is we are so set in our ways, right? Our logic is used to reading words and our brain wants to go that way. When you're learning something new, you have to be willing to stretch a little bit and be uncomfortable so that you can learn and that you can put it in your brain. We leave school, whether it was high school or college, and many of us don't even wanna ever look at another book again. I'm gonna tell you right now, as a business owner, if you're not reading business books and management books and leadership books, your business is gonna stagnate because you are the ladder of how far your business can go. And if you are not educating yourself on how to make your business better and stronger, you are the ceiling. Don't be the ceiling. Keep going, keep stretching. So, just in short, use colors. Call out answers. If I don't finish a sentence, please finish a sentence for me. Raise your hand. Words are short term and pictures are long term. So please make sure that you're drawing your pictures. This is probably the most important slide, most important message I'm gonna share with you out of everything today. And it has nothing to do with accounting or finance or business. We call that our point of power. And in life and in business, you can either live above the point or below the point. When you are below the point, you're in a mode of blame, excuses, and denial. This is why I didn't get my business to the level I wanted. This is who's responsible for not getting it there. And it's amazing how we can put it off on someone else. Denial is when you don't even realize the bad situation you're in. Back in that first couple of days in that beautiful office, <laughs> denial, okay? So it's almost like a stepping stone to get up to the other side. So to get to above the point of power, 
because that's where you are responsible for everything that happened down below. And then you're accountable to set your plan and your vision for what you want in the future. And that's when you have true ownership. Because we all have stuff happen to us. And we tend to fall below the line when it happens or below the point. But if we can stay above the point, responsible means response able. It's just how you respond to what happens to you. And just don't go below that point. Because when you're below the point, you are truly a victim. And you can't fix yourself when you're in victim mode. When you are above the point, you are a victor. And that's when, you know, how many have heard what you think about comes about? Get out from below the point, stay above the point, and think about how am I accountable to the future? And that's what's going to happen. That's when you're going to truly see results. So the only failure in life is if you choose not to participate. If you sit here and think, I heard this before. You know, I don't really need to raise my hand when she says raise my hand. I'm going to take some of it away, but eh, I'm pretty smart. I run a really successful business. Participation is what's going to get you 100% in life. When you go to a networking event, even the introverts, find one person to make a connection with. You don't have to meet 100 like I would want to. You know, I want to go out and give the world a hug. Not everybody is me, I get that. But find one person. Find somebody who looks more intimidated about being in the room than you do and go say hello. Because participation is what makes business owners successful. And the thing is, we all have this I know attitude. I know. Anybody have a teenager? How many times do they say, I know, I got it shuts off conversation faster. It usually is followed in, in teenage world by a slam door. Um, <laughs> but in business, how many times has an employee or a coworker come and told you something and you say, I know? The most important thing they might have been ready to tell you would have come after that and you shut them down so they're not gonna tell you the rest of that sentence. You know, in the world of life, and I went to college as an adult, I think I was almost 50 when I graduated. So, so I was almost sober through the entire thing as most, most college kids. And if, I don't know if you can see this, but this is the world of knowledge, okay? And I, when I started this coaching thing, I thought, you know what? I still remember everything they taught me in marketing class. This is what I know. This little sliver. I know how to read a P&L. I know leadership strategies. I know how to put a five-year plan together. I mean, I know a lot of stuff. That's about how much I know, and I'm being really pretty generous with myself here. This is probably all the stuff I don't even know, that I know I don't know. I know I don't do brain surgery, right? I know that my cell phone works and it connects to my computer and it does things that I don't even understand half the time, but I have no idea how it happens, and I don't want to know. I have other people that <laughs> have to know that for me. But this is all the stuff I don't even know I don't know. So why would I ever say to somebody, I know? So when you get back to work, you can put in place with your employees and your coworkers an I know bucket. Every time somebody says I know, have them throw a buck in a jar. Mm -hmm. And then that jar at the end, you can either buy pizza or donate it to charity. But if we can learn, stop learning to say I know, the world is actually going to be a happier, um, more supportive of each other place. Let me bring up my ADD. I really tend to lose this a lot. So let's lose the I know and replace it with something like, isn't that interesting? Or tell me more. What does that mean for you is a great question. Well, what yeah? If, what, if. what if is a great one. I love that. I really like Brene Brown and she'll say, say more, you know, because even if you know, if because I'm coming at it from like an employee standpoint, even if my manager knows, I don't necessarily know. So it's more like a, well, teach me. Right. I want to learn. Absolutely. And you know what's really amazing? All of the studies that psychologists have done about what makes people happy, you just hit on it. It's learning and achieving a goal. So I want you to think about that with your employees, is if they're coming to work and punching a clock and have to do something, get it done, and go home, chances are you're not contributing to their happiness. 
right? Tony Heisch, when he started Zappos Shoe Store, it's an online shoe store. People have to take orders over the phone for the people who have problems ordering online. And they're thinking, oh, this is not gonna be fun. So he decided his whole business was not about selling shoes, it was about delivering happiness. And so he has a book called Delivering Happiness and how he turned his company of people sitting in cubicles to having more fun than you could ever imagine. When you go into HR, I should have a picture of this on my slide. When you go into their HR office, you sit on a throne. And if you want, you can put on a, a crown and wear a cape and have a scepter. It's fun. You get to decorate your cubicle every four months and the company budgets for it. And you have to move <coughs> from one wing of the building to another wing of the building every four months because it creates a different environment. It's all about opening up to each other. You were going to share? Google is like that, right? Google's headquarters, they are big on, like, but plus that most of their employees have to work, like, long, long hours. But so they have things, like, they cater their lunch, or they have, like, a celebration every so often. Or, uh, there's, like, I think that's the thing. Right, but small business, can we afford that? We oh. probably can't afford to buy lunch for everybody. But can we afford to celebrate the wins? Can we afford to have more fun? I'm trying to rack my brain how Jason, Kurt, and I can have more fun in our, in our office. We do have a bottle of wine and a couple of beers every now and then in the base, <laughs> bottom of that fridge. But, um, you know, it shouldn't just be about that. What can we do to make our work environment more fun? Because that's how you keep employees. So um, you have to be willing to have some fun. Now today, what you can expect are blinding flashes of the obvious. Blinding flashes of the obvious are things you already knew, maybe in one context or another, and we're gonna put them together so that you, are, you have the result of a completely brand new idea. If somebody has a BFO, feel free to yell out BFO and then share it. Because if something made sense to you, it will be important to somebody else sitting at the table, and I can guarantee that. So if you think about your business, is your business driving you, dictating what time you come in, what time you go home, how many hours you work, or are you driving your business? Because the number one thing that people say to me when they sit in my office is, I'm overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. I'm going to tell you the story of Carolyn Hearn in a minute, but burnout People say the number one reason for small business failure, and by the way, it's like 80% in the first five years, is because of cash flow. I think this comes first. When I talk to people, that's the number one thing. I'm making enough money to pay the bills. So they've got maybe not profit, but I can't do it anymore. I'm even pushing away new business because I'm working as hard as I can work and I'm not gonna work any harder. Or I'm gonna lose my marriage, or I'm gonna lose. And we hear it every day, day in and day out. So we wanna make sure that we give you some tips and tricks so that you're not living in burnout. This is one of our tricks and tips. It's called the formula for change. D times V plus F has to be greater than R. D stands for dissatisfaction. V stands for vision. F stands for first steps. And, oh, I'm sorry, it's not, yes, it has to be greater than resistance. So next to the word dissatisfaction, if you wrote it down, what is one thing you're dissatisfied with in your business? Could be money, could be your team, could be how many hours you're working, it could be, we usually, you can categorize them into some way time, team, or money, but I want you to be a little bit more specific than just that. What's one thing you're dissatisfied with? Take a minute and write it down.
Then I want you to go to where you wrote resistance and write what is keeping you from changing it. Why aren't you changing it? So what would the vision be if that problem didn't exist? What would be different? What's that vision? So I'm going to give you an example. I, Kurt and I bought a farm back in 2007 up in the mountains. We bought the farm. <laughs> <laughs> Not the farm, a, a farm. farm. <laughs> and where you had to park your car to the front steps was a little hike across the grass, a little bridge, a little hike up a hill, two steps, maybe eight steps to the front door. And the first time I did it, I was huffing and puffing. I said, this is crazy. And behind that little house was a hill that went like this to the top of the mountain. And it was beautiful up there. Kurt could hike it, my boys could hike it, and I would get halfway up and, oh, hang on, I gotta wait, hang on. I was overweight, and worse than that, I was out of shape, and they are two very different things. I needed to get strong. So my brain said, that's your dissatisfaction. You're chubby and out of shape. My dissatisfaction was absolutely clear. My vision was, my kids are gonna come up here, we're gonna play, I can hike up the mountain with them, there's bike trails all around, we can be active. That was what I wanted. And then it's like, well, what's holding me back? The resistance was? At that time, I was a, a literally a queen of the snooze alarm. I don't wanna get out of bed in the morning and work out. It's just so much nicer to stay in bed. And nobody's kicking me out. So who has the five, four, three, two, one strategy? It's um, Mel, Robbins. Mel Robbins. So that was part of what helped me do it. But I had to get to the point where my vision had to be, and my first steps had to be, and the satisfaction had to be completely clear before I could overcome the resistance of staying in bed. Once I had clarity on these three things, my first steps were, I'm gonna go down to the sports authority or whatever sporting goods store we went to, not Foot Slogger, sorry, Jason. <laughs> we didn't know about you. Um, and buy a pair of sneakers, a pair of leggings, so that I could put on the right clothes and feel good, because we women like to have something, accessories for whatever we're gonna do. That was the first step to, now have I fallen off the ladder and back on? But Twice a, twice a week, Kurt will attest to it at 5.15, this tail's getting out of bed and hiking down to LA Fitness. And yeah, do I still battle with my weight? Yes, but do I have the strength to run up a couple of flights of stairs and not be huffing and puffing? You know, I'm making baby steps. We do this in business. I, you know, I have a worksheet here from a, a workshop that we do every quarter at Grayland. And one of the things I make everybody do is five of them every single quarter. And the people who come again and again and again can still always find five more. It's amazing. <laughs> so think about that formula for change. How many of them could you work through in your life? But get clarity on the vision and the first steps. Now, how many people here are in sales? That exact same formula is for selling, right? First people, of all, everybody here is for sales. Let's start yes. <laughs> Especially you guys, every time you wanted to go on a date, back in the day when girls were too shy to ask men out, it was, it was a sales job, right? So dissatisfaction. You have to uncover what is it that you have to get clarity on. What are they dissatisfied with so that they're going to buy your product or you, right? What is the vision for where they want? So using me, what, 
are you dissatisfied in your business? If you have the business of your dreams, what's the vision? What does that look like? So then what are some of those things that we should be doing? What are 20 things everybody should be doing that they're not doing? And I bet we can all write a list of at least 20. And if we put our mind to it, there's probably hundreds. So that's a really cool system and process. Now, you are speaking less, and I think we didn't chit chat as much in the beginning. So my next slide is lunch, but I'm going to, oh, no, it's not. Okay. <laughs> my slide after that is lunch, and we may go past the lunch slide, depending on what time it is. So how many people here can define what a business is? <laughs> Come on, somebody. You sell to business owners all the time. I'll pick on you. So a business or a successful business? No. Just a business? A, su a successful business, sure. Okay. Um, a profitable business. Awesome. Yes. What else? A group of people with common goals helping other people. Awesome. I love it. Okay, so action has a very precise definition, and this is sort of the platform that everything we teach is based upon. So as you said, it's a commercial, profitable enterprise that works without you. That's when it's successful. So if I were to ask every single person here, can you define what your business will be like when it's finished? And I don't mean that you have to sell it, but it's finished, you've hit your goal, you're not having to be there, you're not working 40 hour weeks, maybe you're working 10 hour weeks. What does finished look like for you? I'm getting way more clarity in that right now um, for our business, and it takes time, and sometimes it even shifts over time. But I want you to think about what's the end? We were shopping last night, and I found out that um, not Lane Bryant, Dress Barn. Dress Barn is closing 600 stores, every single one of them across the country. They're not selling it. They're doing a big go out of business. Anybody know Pham Brownlee? Pham Brownlee is like the Winston-Salem historian at the library in downtown. He's the most awesome man ever. And if you talk to him, he will talk more than me. Um, he has every now and then post things on the Winston-Salem page on Facebook. And he posted two businesses that went out of business this week. One was a coffee shop, and one was a vegetarian restaurant. And I posted my response. I said, we have to be better marketers than we are restaurateurs. We have to be better marketers than we are plumbers. We have to be better marketers than we are whatever we do. Brad said to me, who's the founder of our business, you are a marketer of coaching before you ever get to be a coach. But my question is, I mean, on my end of things, I pretty much stopped marketing because we can't find the employees, the number of employees, the quality of employees that we need to go out and do things. I mean, we, we work in the landscape area, so we're not talking about highly educated. But, I mean, it could be a quality job for somebody who is willing to come in, work, learn to do the job, and it, you could make a decent living off of it. But, you know, right now, we don't have any employees to take care of the work that we have. So how do you grow a business when you're not marketing strictly because you don't have the people to do the work that you need to get done? Mm -hmm. or, and you may be getting to that later on, and if you are, I'll We will get to it a little bit later, but and, and I don't want you to be um, think I'm um, rude, but one of the things Brad said um, to his dad when he was starting this business, I can't find people to work for me that are worth a lick. There's not enough of them, and the ones that come don't stay. And Brad's dad said to him, Brad, you get the people you deserve. And so I don't want to, I didn't say that to make you feel bad, but I mean, in the beginning, when I was in that office and I hired my first coach, I got the people I deserved. I didn't do my due diligence. I had somebody who thought they were excited about becoming a coach and, and talk about doing stupid things in the beginning. I paid. $17,000 for this guy to go get certified in coach training, and I paid him a salary of $2,000 a month plus commission, and three months in, he said, I'm certified, 
and I found this really cool online way to do coaching, and I quit. Now, Kurt, we had, the, we had all the paperwork to sue him, but I didn't want to take my eye off the ball of my vision for what I was building to waste my time with attorneys and courtrooms and whatever, so I chalked it up to God's going to take care of him, and I'm going to go forward. But we have to be diligent in who we hire. So we're screening somebody now to be a coach. It took a long time, a year and a half, to find the next one. But we're going to find somebody who's going to stay and believe in our vision and believe in our mission. And so there, we will get into way more detail in a little bit about that. But the other thing I want to say is if you do want some specifics for your business, and I'm getting there ahead of myself, but there's a complimentary strategy session sheet right here. We'll do an hour, hour and a half with anybody here if you sign up and we will take the things that we talk about and talk it through how it applies to your business, offline, complimentary. Problem is all those dates have passed. <coughs> those are all nines, Jason. I might have written eight on my little notepad because I was still thinking in August. It's a test, you passed. 2020. <laughs> those are They're all nines. They're a year nines. out. <laughs> 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 they are walking so, until next office. So, so, so yeah, we we're going to step right above that point of power, and I gave Jason a pad that had eights on it. <laughs> so we both, <laughs> we're both going to step up and be accountable for what we just did. So that's September. <laughs> so we're going to skip that for a minute. I'm going to give you the intro to what we're going to do after lunch. And then after this slide, we'll take a break, we'll grab our sandwiches and what have you, and then we'll come back. Um, and we'll eat while I'm talking because otherwise we will, business owners get together and you guys tend to talk a lot with each other, which is good. Um, so this is the six steps to how we build a business. This is our recipe for building a business. Anybody here ever bake a cake? Okay, anybody ever get to the point where you could bake a cake without a recipe? Okay, so I can't, can't remember your name. Emily. Emily. How many times did you have to bake it before you got it down pat? Probably, like, uh, what, like without a recipe how many mm -hmm. times did I have to do it? Yeah, how many times did you have to do it with the recipe before oh, you could do it without the recipe? Uh, like maybe a dozen. Okay. And then I screw up the other time. Right. Again. Anybody else? How many times did it take you? Well, I feel like it changes every time. <laughs> <laughs> you said you do it without a recipe? How many times did it take for you to do it? How many times did you have to watch grandma or mom do it before you got to the point where you could do it without your without the recipe? Twenty-five. Twenty-five. <laughs> <laughs> so until it felt right. Building a business is a recipe. There's a recipe for it. These are the steps. We all try, me included, and I knew the steps. That's how crazy it is. We all try to do it without following the recipe, without looking at the recipe, without doing it. Because if you mix up the recipe and you do step seven before you do step two, you might screw up that cake pretty bad, right? So this necessarily isn't in specific order. It starts out in specific order, but your business has different components and different aspects. So as your goals and visions and um, strategies change, you may jump up and down within this recipe. But this is the recipe. The bottom, it starts with mastery. And in mastery, we eliminate chaos. We get control of our numbers. We understand our vision and where we're going. And it's written down and our, you know, we've got it concrete. It's um, understanding what are the processes so that we can deliver, deliver consistently. It's really where we eliminate chaos in a business. Oh, I thought it had the other overlay. That's when we start to get stability. This is when we have a commercial business. It might not be profitable. Then in niche, niche is a fancy word for sales and marketing. So, and I don't know why I always say sales and marketing, because you really should market before you sell, right? You need a lead before you convert it into a customer. Niche is understanding what makes you unique. It's where you start to have predictable cash flow. If you can get to a place where you understand your marketing and how it works, we're gonna go a little bit deeper into that in a little bit. That's when you start to get some cash in your business. The next section is leverage. That's when we start to work on the efficiencies in our business and the systems and processes. The next level is team. And that's when you're truly structured for growth where you can start to delegate the things that you do 
to other people so that you can focus on growing your business and putting your plans in place for the future. Synergy and results are at the end. When you figure out how to do it, synergy is how do I expand this? Because I'm sure that there are landscape companies that have two and three locations. I'm sure, and you may even as well. There are businesses that expand. In the construction industry, that's the one complaint we hear again and again. Trying to find somebody that can put a hammer in their hand and actually do, read a plan, understand what they have to do. It's really hard to find people. So you have to be really good about your strategy on how to hire people. And then once you've got this well-oiled machine and you know how to grow it, results section is your own personal growth. What do you do with your business? I think the first time I had a client who came to me and they were losing money, we finally got them to break even. About two years later, he said, Marianne, after we pay all the bills and everything, we're to the point now where we've got 10 grand in net profit and I'm, I'm not in debt anymore. What do I do with it? I said, what do you want to do with it? He said, I don't know, should I invest it? Should I do this, should I do that? And I said, well, why don't we put a plan in place? Let's do some investment in the markets, let's do some investment in real estate, and let's do some buying <coughs> businesses and flipping businesses. Because you can make money buying and flipping a house, but if you understand this recipe, you can buy and flip businesses, and that's the where you can really make some good money fast. I know somebody who's buying a business that generates $200,000 bottom line. Once we fix it and we put all the numbers in place, that business is for sale for $150,000. Business that's bordering a, a little over a million dollars and they're willing to sell it because they're burned out, they're frustrated, they can't hire people, There's a, and we just want out. We're too old to even try to fix it, Marianne, just help me find a buyer. Those are the businesses we want. And you know what's really cool to the young people in this room? Baby boomers like me are getting done. And a lot of them own businesses. So if you learn this process, buying and flipping a business is so much more fun than buying and flipping a house. And I love decorating houses. <laughs> so this is our system. And we're gonna take a deep dive into every single step when we come back from grabbing a sandwich. So hopefully we can open those doors I think so. I'm gonna put the sandwich right back there. Is lunch ready? Yeah. So we're gonna take a little dive into mastery. And mastery is that section where you have a commercial enterprise, which you know, pretty much you file with the state, you get a sign, you can hang it up, and you're in business. But it doesn't mean that you're a profitable enterprise. So there's four key areas to mastery. There's destination, there's money or finance, time and delivery. So when we think about destination, it's things in your business like your vision. What does your business look like? Can you close your eyes and actually see what it's gonna look like in five years? Those kinds of clarity and goals are really important because if it's just about going out and finding out what you don't want, you know, most people say, I don't want to work in corporate America. I'm starting a business. I don't want a boss. I'm starting a business. But what you have to do is to find what you do want. You wouldn't get into a car and go to North Dakota to visit family without putting the address of where you're going in North Dakota. Now, you might get close just using a old map or no map. You kind of know the general direction. But if you really want to get somewhere, you need to have that GPS with real clarity. And that's one of the hardest things for people to do because they don't really see it as being that important. I'm just gonna work harder doing what I'm doing. But the minute you can get clarity, because you might even find your aunt's house in North Dakota, but without putting it in the GPS, it's gonna take you a whole lot longer to get there. You're gonna make a whole bunch of wrong turns. So having that vision for yourself allows you to make a whole lot less wrong turns. So when it comes to vision, anybody here ever hear of Pure Bar? Pure Bar is an exercise um, franchise. There, um, this woman on the screen, Carolyn Hearn, she owned two of them, she still owns them, um, one in Clemens and one here in Renolda Village. 
And this is actually a quote from her book because she wrote a, the first paragraph is anyway, um, she wrote a book after she finished the first two, two and a half years of her coaching program. And I'm gonna read this and I don't tend to read slides, but my first meeting with Mary Ann required a lot of tissues. And I'm not talking a few. There was fluid, bodily fluid coming out of every orifice. She threw her financial binder from her CPA on my desk and said, I can't effing do this anymore. I have an effing MBA from effing Wake Forest School of effing management. She went on and on. She was mad. She said, I'm single. I'm married to my business. <laughs> I thought she was like a relative. Um, she said, I'm married to this business. I'll never find a man. I live in a rented house because I'm not making enough money. I can't even pay off the debt that I'm in to buy this business. And she was just furious. And then we sat down and I got her to calm down and we used a couple of boxes of tissues. Why can't I make it work? Please help, she says. We talked a little bit more and as we reached the end of the meeting, she asked if I was ready to start coaching and how I would like to pay for her services. I had no extra money. I handed her my American Express card and thought, and it was what the F do I have to lose? If I don't do this, I'll probably be filing for bankruptcy. And if it works, sweet. Mm -hmm. So she just got married to the guy of her dreams. She bought a house in West End about six months before she met him. She has two businesses that run completely without her. Her business loan and her car loan were completely paid off. I'm trying to think what other like milestone. She won the best small business under 20 people nationally in our national survey. She's not even a member of the Chamber of Commerce in Winston, and she came back from winning the award with us out in, um, we were in Vancouver when she won. Um, she lands here, and about three months later, four months later, she wins the best business in Winston-Salem from the Chamber of Commerce, and she wasn't a member of the Chamber of Commerce. It was picked by some bank who had read her story or followed her blog. So now she's written a book. She's in the middle of writing her second book. She her book is called She's on Her Toes, How I Built a Business, Almost Lost It, and Got It Back Again. She had to get clarity of what she wanted and stop talking about what she didn't want. And I just went to her wedding. We're awesome friends. So the cost of not having mastery, especially financial mastery, is, am I in the way? My husband's telling me to move. I'm in the way of the slide. So small business owners, and you've probably heard this from a million people, the reason they fail, they're saying, is because of cash flow, not understanding their, their finances. It not only hurts their business, it hurts their family. Anybody out here ever been stressed about money? And how much of an AH were you when you got home, right? Because you can't keep it. Everything, when you're a business owner, it doesn't just affect your business. It affects everything about you and you carry it with you. And so if we can get your business in order, it usually gets your life in order. And that was the experience with Carolyn. So um, when you start to go from chaos to control and you're in control, then that requires processes. So how many people here are the more the analytics side rather than the touchy-feely side? So those analytics people, what we have to do is collect data, track the data, figure out how we're gonna save money once we have the data, and then put a plan in place on how we're gonna spend that money, not just spend it. Financial mastery um, doesn't only include looking at the numbers that you're, you get from your C CPA or your bookkeeper. It's not just your P&L and your balance sheet and your cash flow. <coughs> and how many people really look at all three of those every single month? Part of it is understanding those numbers, and a lot of business owners don't look at them because they don't understand them. And they're, sometimes it's ego, I don't want to tell somebody I don't understand what I'm really supposed to do with all these numbers. At the bottom, if it's, if it's black and not red, I'm happy. And that's about as far as they go with looking at those reports that come every <coughs> month. But we have to figure out how to take that data and make decisions. And then we have to go beyond that data to figure out what are our key performance indicators. So. Key performance indicators are those things that will, for a farmer, it might be sun and rain. How much did it rain? How much sun do we have? In your business, there might be 
how many times did the phone ring? How many times did we actually go out and make a quote? And everybody says, oh, I've got a CRM system. That data's in there. And I call BS on that. Because the data's in there, but nobody pulls it out. Nobody reads it. Nobody looks at over time. Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Mm -hmm. So understanding financial mastery in your business should be one of those key time blocks on your calendar for understanding and growing your business. And one of the keys is budgeting. How many people here use QuickBooks? One, two, three, a good 80%, maybe more. QuickBooks allows you to go in and run a profit and loss statement. And you change where it says this month or last month to this year and then you change the column to months, and it'll give you your first, right now, you'll get your first eight months of data, and then it'll give you blank columns. Take those blank columns, and that's homework for when you get out of here, and go fill in what you think the rest of the year is gonna look like. Is it gonna look better? Is it gonna look worse? If the top line numbers don't look so great, then you have to figure out, do you have to adjust your labor expense? Do you have to adjust some of those general expenses, those things that really you have to pay whether you do business or you don't do business. But if we're not always looking at least six months out as to what does the projection look like, it's usually too late before we're in trouble. All of a sudden it's like, uh-oh, we're in trouble. How did we get here? But if we can really sit down and take the time as the owner of a business, not just the self-employed person who's doing the plumbing, and look at those numbers, it will change the way you think about your business. So budgeting and reporting those metrics are so important. Now, I'm not gonna try to explain this whole slide because it takes a little time, but these are the things at the, at the very least you need to know when it comes to those actual financial reports. You need to know, first of all, what are your fixed, fixed costs? Those are the things that they're gonna come whether you sell a widget or don't. Right, it's your rent, it might be your car payment or your truck payment or your, um, the utilities on your building. There are certain things that you have to pay no matter what, those are fixed. Even, and I always get confused with fixed and variable. I like it to be, what are my expenses and what are my cost of goods? So here is all your expenses, your general expenses, your marketing expense, that's one that although it's a general expense, it, you can adjust that based on how the business is doing. And what do most people do when business is bad? Gee, we are, they back off on marketing. Now, team aside, so we're not gonna tackle that problem, but the business is, you know, we're not making the money. We still have team, we have a product, but we're not making the money, so they stop marketing. Well, I probably would have said this in the next section, but if you have a business and you do not market it, it's like having a baby and not feeding it. It will not thrive and it may even die because that's what keeps it growing. And a business that is not growing is dying. So if you have a problem that is stopping you from growing, it's time to get really serious, really serious about fixing that problem and putting a growth strategy in place. Total expenses is when you add your cost of goods, where is it, your variable cost, which is also the cost of goods. So if somebody says variable cost, it's what does it cost you to deliver your product or service or make your product or service. So cost of goods or cost of services. You add those together and together and you get your total expenses, which is that yellow line. Your revenue is the blue line. And over time, there'll be a point in time when you have hit your break even. And once you're beyond break even, that little space in here is your profit. And understanding what, like when in the month are you at break even? And so if it's the 20th of the month, you should probably have this little celebration. Woohoo, everything we make from the 20th to the 30th is mine. So if you know those numbers, actually it feels good because you wouldn't wanna go to a football game or a baseball game or play any sports without knowing what the score is because it would be no fun. But if you know the score in your business and you think of it as a game, it does make these numbers not feel so heavy. It makes them really exciting for you. <coughs> so the next thing you have to know is where do you hit max utilization? When is that time when I need that next truck? 
When do I need to hire that next person? And that all has to be part of your plan. How much money do we have to be making before I know I can pull the trigger on one more employee? Or how do we find creative ways to grow, maybe using you know, subcontractors or whatever the solution is for your business, understanding what max utilization is and what is the plan to get beyond max utilization. Those are just some of the financial numbers that we look at. So here's some key performance indicators that you might have in your business. What's your break even? How many leads come in in a, a given week? How many people are tracking the number of leads? That is so critical and when we get to the sales and marketing part, I'll explain to you why. What's your average dollar sale? Now that's important because if you're gonna do some marketing down the road, if you know your average dollar sale, you can start to decide what am I willing to spend to buy a client? So how much money do I spend in marketing based on what my average dollar sale is? And then beyond average dollar sale, do you know what the lifetime value of your client is? So if you do have a landscaping contract and it's a corporation and you're doing their landscaping and you charge them five grand a month, well, you have to calculate what's your annual value for that client and what's the lifetime value? On average, do clients stay a year or two or five or 15? Because if you have a client and your average client lifetime is two years, then that's a really important number to know. You take your time versus you know, how much money do they spend over that lifetime, and then you can say, well, you know what, my lifetime value is 10 grand for a client. I can afford to spend $500 to buy a customer. So thinking about business from a completely different perspective than just working hard on what you do is everything we're getting at. Dollars per payroll hour. How much money are you making for every hour of payroll that you have put out there? And if you track that, so what I do is I take that P&L that I've generated from QuickBooks and down below net profit, I start to log in other key metrics. So. Now I have my income, how many hours of payroll? Let's do the division and figure out what's my productivity. Um, how many leads did I get that month? Because if I've got 10 leads and I've closed three new accounts, then I know I have to adjust my forecast for new business. How many clients did I lose this month? So one of the things with Carolyn Hearn's business was, all I said to her team is every single one of you, I want you to think about, because in a fitness business, people quit as fast as they join, right? You get disillusioned and you drop off. We wanted to be net one new client every single month. How hard was that for everybody to wrap their head around? Net one new client. And it was amazing. The team would start looking on the 20th of the month. How are we doing? Did we lose any? Who did we get? Who can we call? It was such an easy goal for everybody to wrap their head around. People say, what did you do to change that business? I didn't change it. I gave them the recipe. They changed it. So income per employee is another one. In the restaurant industry, there are. you can, And for many businesses, you can go out and buy those key ratios for your business. What should your payroll be? Um, what should your income be per employee in restaurant or in landscaping or in what should your income be per um, per hour? There's all kinds of um, ratios on business that you can actually go out and purchase. So everybody get that? Does it? Did I ring home? Does it feel comfortable or uncomfortable? Who's in the uncomfortable based on what you're doing in your business right now? Right. So. And you don't have to change everything at once. A lot of times people come to these workshops and they're like, oh my God, I'm overwhelmed. I'm not doing anything right. Well, just think if you do one more thing right and your business is already thriving, it's only going to get better. And it's only going to get better every time you take another step up that ladder. Another area in mastery, and we're still on the bottom. We've only been in like 10 minutes into the content. Anybody think it's valuable? Okay. So time mastery. When you have, the, the best way to time master, even though team comes later, you have to sometimes have somebody that you can delegate to, right? Because you can't grow your business. So <coughs> how many of you are spending time doing $10, $12 an hour tasks that you shouldn't be doing? 
And in the past, you used to have to hire somebody. Right now, there's a million virtual assistants out there. Used to be TaskRabbit. Now there's a whole bunch of different ones. Um, but you can hire people to do some of the menial things. You can even hire concierge to go to the dry cleaner for you because you used to get up in the middle of the day just because you were done. So I'm going to go to the dry cleaner. I'm going to go to the post office. But that's where you start to get into delusion, down in that denial part of that po below the point. Now, if you love the guy you do your dry cleaning with, because I kind of do, he's a client, we like to go to the dry cleaner. <laughs> so sometimes we plan that right in our calendar. But in Time Mastery, understand the importance of urgency. Focus on the high priority tasks. So these are high priority tasks. Is there time on your calendar for marketing? Is there time on your calendar for billing? I actually coached an attorney. When I sat down, she was complaining about cash flow, and I found out she hadn't billed half of her clients in months because she's a social worker in her head. That's what she was before an attorney, and she felt bad asking for money. Her team was stressed, she was stressed, her children were miserable. We hired somebody within her company to do the billing and do it immediately, and it was amazing how her cash flow improved. <coughs> so collection of debts. Purchasing, looking at where do you get your products or services? Can we do better on that end? I don't like to focus too much on cost savings. I'd rather, if, if in a point when you're trying to grow your business, let's focus on growth rather than cost savings. Delegate the cost savings to somebody else. Know your KPIs, positive cash flow activities. What are those things that are actually going to bring in cash? You want to focus on high pr productivity items. So did anybody here ever read Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? There's a chapter in it with the time quadrants. So this is based on Stephen Covey's book. We've just taken his four quadrants, which we kind of thought were out of order, and said one of his categories is not urgent and not important. This is the category that we call distraction. Anybody know what that is? Have some ideas? TV. TV. Perfect. What else? Phone. 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 How many times a day does the average person look at their phone? 100. Yeah, I don't know. It's actually 150. That was the latest statistic I saw. 150 times a day. So I'm getting in the habit now of putting, keeping my phone in my handbag. And then I bought this thing just a week ago, and I couldn't figure out how to make it stop ringing every time my phone rang and binging every time I got a text. I just figured out yesterday how to do it. So it shouldn't ring or bing today. <coughs> um, I was so afraid it would ring while I was doing this. So what are those things that you get distracted by? It can also be surfing the internet, right? Oh, I'm just gonna go in under the delusional guise of I'm gonna do a business post, and then, ooh, look at what's happening this weekend. Oh, the Wine Alliance is getting together. And then you send a text to your spouse or your friend to see if they wanna go to the Wine Alliance, and before you know it, you've wasted 10 minutes. And how many times a day do we do that? So. Being militant about your time in this distraction area is important. No more than 10% of your time, because you have to spend 10% of your time there. The next area is urgent and not important. What's urgent and not important? So the thing that I think rings home for me most is when it's somebody else's urgent and not important. Hey, Mary Ann, you got a minute? I've got a time blocked out now on my calendar. I said, if you look at my calendar, and it says focus time, unless you're bleeding, don't knock on my door. Because if I don't do that, I'll never get time to work on me and work on the important stuff. But people knocking on your door, because we want to be the heroes in business. We want to have the answer to everything. So everybody take off your, untie it, take off your Superman cape, because we don't have to be the heroes. Hire people smarter and willing to work harder than you are and you focus on growing your business. But delusion is when you're letting other people affect your schedule and you don't have control of it. The next one is urgent and important. That's where we should spend 60% of our time. Sometimes it's putting out fires. It's dealing with our most important clients. It's, um, you know, what other activities for you are urgent and important? Maybe it's a deadline that you have to meet for a client. Tax time, deadlines, um, that's urgent and important. But where you really have spent, 
need to spend an important, a really core 20% of your time, and this is the area to be militant in. You're there now. You didn't have to give up your lunch hour and walk away from your business to think about how do I make my business better. You guys chose to do that. That was a choice. So you're already ahead of the game from your competition. But that's the zone. That's where we are learning, and that's what we're doing today. It's where we take time to sit and write our plan. Here's an easy way to get in the zone every day. 10 minutes at the end of the day, write your top three things you're gonna do tomorrow. So at 10 to five, set an alarm on your phone and have it tell you it's time to write out what you're gonna do tomorrow. At the end of the week, take a half hour to figure out what you're gonna do next week on a Friday. And if you do it on Friday, and you have your game plan for what you're gonna do on Monday, I guarantee you'll enjoy your weekend better because you're not gonna be worried about what's happening on Monday. And then at the end of the quarter, every quarter, take a day to plan the next quarter. Now we do something called Growth Club up at Grayland and business owners come together. It's sort of like a little spa day for your business because hey, we're at Grayland. Um, and we write our 90 day plan we do a refresher, a little bit deeper dive into the content with a little bit more specifics. We give you a checklist of things that you could or should be working on in your business and help you write your game plan for the next 90 days. And why is it important to do quarterly planning every 90 days and not just do an annual plan? Mm -hmm. Things change. And if you only had an annual plan, people tend to get really busy November and December because they didn't keep up with all the things on their list. So every 90 days, pull out that plan you wrote, the annual plan you wrote in the beginning of the year, and then at the end of the year, I, tax accountants might not like this, and I don't know how with the laws have changed since I first started <laughs> saying this, but we used to say, hey, let's take the team and go away for two or three days someplace nice and put together our strategy for the next one to three years. Planning is so important. Pepsi didn't get to be Pepsi. The Zappos company didn't get to be Zappos with just working really hard. They take the time to have strategy days and planning days and where are we going and get everybody on board for the vision because otherwise you're carrying that vision in your head as the sole owner of this business and you know what, it gets heavy. But if you share that vision with two or three or five other people and they're helping you achieve that vision, all of a sudden it's not heavy anymore. It's this really light, amazing thing that we're building. So um, make sure that you're staying in the zone at least 20% of the time. So um, when it comes to time, this is a client, his name is Darren Garcia. He owns Solid State Tile and now he owns a company called Peak Performance. And he said, I feel the value of the coaching program because he's gotten control of his time in his life. He came to me and he said, I have a new baby girl and I have guys that show up at my house and we're working like crazy. He said, and they're a pain in the ass because I make my money by doing this. $8, $8, $8. Every time I lay a tile on a shower wall, I make $8 and every time one of my team asks me a question, it's, pardon my French, shit, I just lost $8. He said, I don't want to have a team. He's got nine crews, and he just started a general contracting firm called Peak Performance, or Peak, Peak Build and Design, I'm sorry, Peak Build and Design. Um, I'm gonna tell a couple of stories about him later, but now he has his second child, he's got a little boy, He's got a beautiful office just behind Stratford Road, and most of the time he's doing woodworking, which is his hobby. He likes to build furniture. He doesn't sell it. <laughs> he just builds it, gives it to his friends. But he's got a business that completely runs without him, which is really cool. In fact, he posted something on Facebook the other day. It was just him sitting behind a desk. He would have never even thought about that vision five years ago. So are you delivering consistently? in your business. Consistently, consistency is the fourth area of um, mastery. And so in consistency, let me just make sure. There are a bunch of areas in consistency. One of them is supply mastery. 
understanding your supply and can you get your supply consistently. Um, quality, sometimes when they do business with the owner, they get a different level of quality than when they do business with an employee. How do we change that? Um, making things easy to buy. Anybody here ever say, we don't take American Express? Stop it. If you do, stop it. Make it easy to buy. Because if you don't take American Express, I'm going to find someplace else to shop. I'd rather you charge me 3%, which is maybe the, the largest difference it will be from Visa, and just took my card. So if you're uncomfortable about taking credit cards, raise your prices 5% and start taking credit cards. It's easy. And then what you can say is, gee, if you pay in cash, I'll give you a 5% discount. If that's your concern. But make it easy to buy. And I'm not saying do it at the risk of your happiness and your <laughs> success in, in building your business. But make sure that it's easy to buy. And then make sure your service is um, of top quality. So you need your product to be of quality and you need your service to be of quality. So any questions in mastery? You don't have to say this. You don't have to even write it down. On a scale of 1 to 10, destination, mission, vision, mission, culture, financial mastery, <coughs> KPIs, time mastery, how you spend your time, and delivery mastery. If you are nailed, it's a 10. If, gee, there's, I, I'm not hitting the mark on any one of them, it's a 1. Give yourself a score, mentally. It's easy to teach you. It's simple to get the steps in place. It's not always easy to do. So you do it a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. And part of that planning is making sure that you're doing it a little bit at a time. Got it? Got it. Got it. Good. Okay. So the next level, and we're only on level one, but we're going to go through. They get quicker as we go up, I promise. So niche is our fancy word for sales and marketing. That's when we can actually start to build profitability into our business. And I gave you the clue. What is our definition of niche or marketing? Good marketing. It is no price competition. How many people here say, I, I got to keep my prices low or I'm not going to be competitive? You guys, what do you think of your service? Do you all deliver awesome service? Are you better than 80% of the people out there? Being the highest price in the market usually gives your clients a better impression of you, not a worse impression of you. Oh, it must be a quality product. So don't compete on price. But the way to create your niche so you don't compete on price is through what we call our USP, a unique selling proposition or a guarantee. So no price competition is um, making sure that you've got something that when people close their eyes and they hear your brand, they're going to know what it is. So with Darren Garcia and his tile company, as he started to build crews, he said, I'm going to do a survey because I couldn't figure out my USP. I like tile. How complicated is tile? You know, I'm going to do a good job. Well, that's what you're expected to do. So he talked to the general contractors he worked for and some of his clients over in Buena Vista, and they said, dust and dirt. You contractors are slobs. I find cigarette butts in soda cans. I find dust and grime. People come and do a bathroom. They leave all the dust. You cut your tile. It makes a mess. So his unique selling proposition slash guarantee was leave no trace behind. And he had his guy that did his website create a graphic of a work boot with the red circle with the line through it like I had <laughs> earlier. And it's imprinted on every employee's right shoulder. So when they're bending over doing tile work or doing any work in the construction industry, everybody can see the leave no trace behind guarantee. When employees come on board, he says to them, if you leave a mess, you and the rest of the crew is going to go back and clean it, and you won't get paid for it. And if you don't agree to that, then don't come work here. And it's amazing. He can find people to work for him. He was looking for people. He's interested off outside of work in um, CrossFit. So he started to tap into the CrossFit guys to come work for him. And so one of the things that is on his bucket list, and I don't know if he's done it yet, 
They all happen to be very goth. I'm sorry, I apologize if this is slightly sexist. But he said, we all look great. We all think that we can do something to raise awareness of, um, and it was, I think, veterans. So what's the veteran charity? Um, Wounded Warriors. Wounded Warriors. They're going to do a calendar of them shirtless doing construction work and doing CrossFit work, and they're going to sell it for um, Wounded Warriors. That was one of the last things I saw on his bucket list. I don't know if they've actually done it. Um, so make sure that everything that you're doing, you test. So gee, I don't know what my message is. Today with social media, you can come up with a USP, put an ad on Google for a day for $20, and you can run two campaigns side by side. Which one got the most clicks, which one got the most views, and then you'll know which message resonates. So we can use the internet now to test and measure marketing relatively inexpensively. You can also use it to test and measure how you're um, searching for people, right? What's the message that you're getting to entice people to want to come and work for you? And you can test those messages on social media to see where you're getting the biggest um, impact. And so guarantees are another really, really important thing for marketing, not just for protecting yourself. A lot of people don't want to give a guarantee because they think it's going to negatively affect their bottom line. Well, the ad campaign by, I'm not even going to tell you who, you're going to like the way you look. I guarantee Who was that? The Warehouse Warehouse. The most successful ad campaign they have ever run. Now, I think the guy went to jail for some other fraudulent <laughs> stuff, so we're going to discount that. But when that ad ran, it was one of the most successful. He didn't really guarantee anything. It says you can set the rules for your guarantee, right? So he, Darren had the leave no trace behind guarantee. We deal with a business broker, Ron Buck, and he said, I can't guarantee anything. People buy a business if it doesn't do well or it fails. Ah, it's not my, so what can you guarantee? He came back and he said, I got my guarantee. It's all set. He said, I'm going to guarantee that you will never have a question left unanswered during the process of purchasing this business. He said, I answer everybody's questions anyway. <laughs> I'm doing it anyway. So how many people here have a guarantee? One, two, raise your hand. Everybody has a guarantee. Because legally, if you're not delivering the product or service, you're liable, right? And if a customer complains, you are going to do whatever it takes to make it right to the best of your ability. You're, if the, the easy, lazy way could be, to the best of my ability, I will make it right. I guarantee. So to the best of your ability could be, you know, that's, but will that put trust in the client's head when you say to them, I guarantee that I'm going to do everything I can to do this right. But we don't use it. Zappos said you can reach, because they're thinking, I have to sell shoes online. Everybody's used to going down to the shoe store and putting a pair of shoes on and walking in them. Do they feel good? Now I'm going to sell them online. I guarantee that you can return them for any reason, any time, and we will give you your money back. Now, one woman bought a pair of shoes every single week, and she returned them, and she bought a new pair, and she returned them, and she bought a new pair, and they turned it into a marketing campaign. <laughs> They said, we are not afraid that more people will do that because 95% of the population is not that jerk, <laughs> right? It's too much trouble to do that. She was sort of testing them, I guess. But give your guarantee, hold up to it, and that makes people trust you because people buy from who they know, like, and trust. trust. So the next step in what makes marketing and um, and sales work in your business is understanding this concept. We call it the business chassis because most people know how many customers they have. That's a number most of them know. They know what, how much money they made, at least how much money they made this week. Um, they know how much profit they take in, or we hope they do. And more and more I'm finding that not everybody knows that. But all of those three things are just results. You can't go to the customer store or the income store or the profit store. You, you have to do something to get those. So um, 
if you want to leverage in your business, we're going to teach you this business chassis. So a long time ago, the Carmen Ghia and the Volkswagen were built on the same chassis, very different cars. I think this is the Audi R8. They keep changing the slide on me and the VW Golf. It's amazing how many different cars can be built on the same chassis. Which one do you want? Do you want the Audi or do you want the VW? It all depends on how you build this chassis. So it comes down to testing and measuring everything you're doing in your marketing and in your business. So I'm gonna start with, we wanna get more customers. So we need more leads and we need to convert those leads and you have to know those numbers. And that's how you get to customers. And then you need to know for each customer, how many transactions do I do? So we just work these numbers for a real estate firm and pretty much we put in, in a given year, you're gonna sell one house. Um, but there are some clients who buy multiple houses because they flip houses. So that number was like 1.0 something something, I don't remember. Average dollar sale. What is the average dollar sale? And if you sell something for $8 and something for 800, I don't care. Let's find out what the average number is. And that's how you get to revenue. So the accountants don't like this because they'll tell you income <laughs> minus expenses equals profit. But once we have our revenue, then we multiply it times our gross margin percent, and that's how we get to profit. So I'm gonna throw in some numbers just to show you why this is important. So this is an auto detail shop over on Silas Creek Parkway. They had 4,000 leads, and they converted about 25% of them. So they had 1,000 customers. This was the year before they started working with Action Coach. Number of transactions, two. Spring, fall, people came and got their car detail, and they charged about $100 for that detail. That generated about $200,000 for this small business. Two young guys, buddies, started the shop, and their profit margin was 25%, so they got to keep, top line, $50,000. So there are strategies, and I brought this just so I can show you how many. I know that looks like an eye chart, but that column is all the strategies that we can think of at the time of this printing to increase your number of leads. It's you know, direct mail, trade journal advertising, sending a school newsletter if you have something that appeals to families, press releases, vehicle wraps, car signage, in, uh, web pages. There's, I don't know, I don't know how many are there, maybe 70. Do you think if we did three or four of these new ones for your business, you could grow? You could grow your number of leads. What percentage? Five percent? 15% if you're really focused on marketing. Anybody have a number? 10%. 10 percent. I like your number because we're going to do a 10% increase. <laughs> and I did not plant that. <laughs> Most people say more because for this auto detail shop, they we did not do exactly 10%. We did more, but for math, and I can remember these numbers, <laughs> we're going to go with 10%. So 4,400 leads. That's actually eight more leads a week. You could pick up the phone and call eight past clients and ask for referrals to get eight more leads a week. They increase their conversion rate 10%, not to 35%, but to 27.5. Just a little tiny change. We have, if you have a better sales process on how do you follow up with every lead that has come in, how quickly do you follow up? In the construction industry, People say, I called seven people to come and cut down my tree, and I can't get anybody to call me back. So can you increase your conversion rate with knowing these are the steps? We actually have a 13-step sales process between number of leads and conversion rate on how we drip on new clients. So they did that, and they were able to increase both conversion rate and leads, and they got 210 more clients. Little tiny changes, big impact. And through the marketing that they did to increase leads, they actually got some of their existing customers to come back more frequently, so their number of transactions went to 2.2. Tiny improvement. And we convinced them to raise their price. $10, nobody even noticed. I bet everyone in this room could raise your price right now, 10%, and no one would even notice. And 10%, whatever your annual revenue is, take 10% and it'll drop right to the bottom line because you're already covering all your expenses. 
your revenue for this little company increased $92,000 by making tiny, tiny changes. Profit margins, again, raising the price helped that a little bit, but ma managing your profits is the job of the owner. Looking at cost of goods, looking at labor, looking at productivity, looking at how what is the production rate in your business, this business was able to grow their profit to $80,000. So number of leads is marketing. Number of what your conversion rate is, is your sales process and your sales strategy, and they are two very different things. Marketing brings in the lead, how you convert that lead is your sales. Number of transactions is your um, retention. How well do you retain clients? Average dollar sale is your pricing and bundling strategy. Because you're not always going after wallet share, which is the top line, you're go, I mean, over, over market share, which is the top line, you're going after wallet share. If your client base already knows, likes, and trusts you, sell them something else. We can't just be limited to the product lines that we currently have now. Um, so we did pricing, and then profit margin is you. How well do you run and manage your business? Everything we do with a client will eventually work towards creating these numbers and recreating these numbers and looking at these numbers because that's how we build business after business. The interesting thing about everything I've told you so far is you are all sitting here and I can tell you I have done this presentation probably 30 times a year for the last 10 years. Zero percent of you will make a change. Five ways numbers. I have told people again and again, clients who pay me lots of money, I come to their office, where's the five ways numbers? Oh, I haven't done it. This, if you just put those numbers on the wall and look at them, they're going to go up 5%, maybe even 10%. It's going to change your business. But I can tell you, the people who sit and listen do nothing. Make an appointment. Have us tell it, you what it does for you, and you will see some change. So those numbers I just showed you, if you could just do 10% in each category in your business, that's a 43% increase in revenue and a 61% increase in profit. How many people don't want a 61% increase in profit but need a 61% increase in profit? Hmm. So what would you do with the extra 30 grand? You could buy a car, you could go to the beach, but doing this also frees up your time. It is amazing how when you start to work on your business, you get more time. What would you do with 300 more hours? You can spend it with the important people who maybe you're not spending so much time with. Celebrate with your team. If your team feels that you're stressed, they're stressed. Warren Buffett said, it's not necessary to do extraordinary things to get extraordinary results. He's worth 85 billion. At the time this graph was done, he was worth 62 billion. You might have started here with not, you know, here, 6,000, 7 million from 15 to 35. So let's just pretend that's 7,000. This was 600 when you were 15. Mm -hmm. You might be at 67,000. You might be somewhere between here and here. It, he wasn't until he was age 50 something that he started to do that. So the potential is limitless for entrepreneurs. And there, if you are doing this all on your own, trying it, you're not working for the man, you are an entrepreneur. It's changing your business model. It's thinking differently about what you're doing in your business. We have seen businesses do this. Not 85 billion, but that percentage growth, but that percentage growth. Yeah. Well, we just got started. <laughs> <laughs> and was it scary? He was scared. Oh, Is yeah. it scary? Yeah, at first. Is it scary now? No, it's exciting. Isn't that cool? Thank you. So leverage is when you now have a business that works. I love, Jason brought this quote back from some action coach training he went to, and it is? What you don't write down, you're destined to repeat yourself again. 
Did everybody hear that? What you don't write down, you are destined to repeat yourself again. So whether it's, hey, what's the password for the program we have to get into? I'll tell you, but put a page in our procedure book. I must say that all the time. Gee, what do we have to pack to come here? Where's the checklist? Pull out the checklist. Then I don't have to get up from my desk and say, remember the books, remember the pad, remember the, the there's a checklist. Writing procedures might seem mundane and it might be easier to just do it yourself. I can do it faster if I just do it myself. That is the crux of business failure. Stop doing it yourself. So I told you we loved acronyms. Everybody's heard the team one, right? What's the team acronym? Together, everyone, everyone achieves more. This one was new to me when I first started this. Systems are all about saving yourself time, energy, and money. So literally, we started out, now we have a tool in Microsoft 365 that lets us create this cool procedure book, so we're redoing it. But I just started out with a Word document, and we have a page for everything that has to happen in the business. It has a page for every piece of software we use, for every marketing tool we have, for every event that we plan. When do we, so we do Growth Club on the um, third month of every quarter. So when do we have to start marketing it? What, what are the messages we market? It is all now getting, and it's getting tighter and tighter and tighter every time we do it. That needs to be done or you will do it yourself forever in your business. So there are four ways to leverage through people and education. And the only thing that scares people on this level is it's a lot of money to educate my people. And what if they leave? Well, what if they stay stupid and they stay? <laughs> <laughs> right? Systems and technology. When I started in business in corporate America, to buy a, something like a CRM was hundreds of thousands of dollars and you paid software companies to come in and implement it. And now for about $19 a month, you can buy any software online <coughs> that's in the cloud and you get the upgrades for free. Why wouldn't we put in as many systems to improve our, improve our technology? Looking at your delivery and distribution of your product, that's something where you really have to write down your systems and track and measure. But it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be a photograph. This is what the truck looks like at the end of the day. And if it doesn't look like this in the morning when you take the truck out, let's find out who brought the truck back the night before because they'll be held to pay. We worked with a disaster restoration company um, Paul Davis, I think was the name of the company. That was like my third client. And this woman inherited the company from her dad. He had passed away. And she said, I sit in this beautiful office that my dad left me. And every morning the trucks go out. She had about eight or nine restoration crews that went out. She said, inevitably, three of them come back. And so all we did, we made a photograph and a checklist of what had to be in the truck. The person at the end of the day had to sign off that that's what it looked like. The person in the morning had to sign off that yes, that's what I picked up. And if there was a discrepancy, it got fixed before they left the parking lot. Delivery and distribution. And then testing and measuring everything. Your marketing, your productivity, your finances. What are those KPIs? So in systemizing a business, and we have a book here, Instant Systems, these are the things that help you systemize. And many of them we've talked about. How clear are you on your vision? A vision is short and sweet and memorable. Mine is world abundance through business re-education. Our mission is about a page and a half long on how we do that. So vision is where, mission is what. Culture is how do we behave while we're doing it. And that, for hiring and understanding your sales process, is very important. Making sure you have SMART goals and that you write them down daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually. Organizational chart. Create an organizational chart for where your business is right now. And if everything was, you know, roses and sunshine, what would it look like in three years? Because if you don't have that plan for growth, even with your people, you're not going to get there. So do an org chart three years out. Positional contracts, that replaces your job descriptions. If you have job descriptions for your team, 
call them your employment contracts, make them sign that this is not only what they're gonna do, but what they're gonna achieve. Include your culture statement and your vision, saying that they will work hard to achieve both. Because most of the time when you have to let someone go, it's because of the culture statement. They're not living up to your culture. That's the number one reason why people are not, you don't want them to stay in your company. Make sure you have how-to systems, that was our procedure book, and management systems. Now, if you're not gonna manage everything, make sure that the people who you are gonna promote are gonna know what does it mean to be a manager within your organization. So that is leverage. Got it? Good. I think I see nodding. <laughs> so everybody ready to s take a dive into team? Team is shorter, I promise. It gets shorter and shorter. Team is when you have your system that works without you. Doesn't mean you don't have people that work for you along the way, but this is when you're starting to put in management team and that you can focus on growth and they can focus on getting the job done. Because management is, is really the what you have to do. Leadership is who you have to, you know, when you're a leader, who do you have to be to lead this team? Here, when you're starting to build your team, that's your management team, you're taking off that management hat, that hero cape, and giving it to somebody else so that you can plan on the future. So I always get a kick out of this. <laughs> Tom Peters says, most employers are motivated, energetic, committed, enthusiastic, and loyal, except for the eight hours they work for you. <laughs> now, it's not my quote. <laughs> so who do we have to be to have the team we want to have? Are we being the guy? Because people don't usually leave a job, they leave a boss. Mm -hmm. If they feel like they've got leadership and that there's care and there's concern, and it's not always money. If you pay somebody a wage that they can live on and they enjoy what they're doing, they will stay even when somebody offers them more money. So. Once you have, you start to have a team, as the owner, you want to make sure that your job is to focus on the team. It's the team's job to take care of the customers, and the customers will take care of you with paying you and giving you referrals and helping you build your little circle even bigger. But the minute you go around your team and go directly to the customers, you have just undermined them and made them feel less important because nobody loves to just do a thing. They want to have a goal. And if you step in and interrupt them working towards a goal, you're not going to have a motivated team. So make sure as the owner, your number one, number one job is the team. But on that whole circle, who's the most important? What's the most important on that circle? Customers. Everybody agree with that? Yeah. So you're on a desert island, <laughs> and there's no food and there's a gun and one bullet, and you've got the gun. Who goes first? The customer is the least important. You are the most important. There will be no company if you're not there. Your vessel has to be full so you can pour into your team, your customers, and your business. So you are the most important person in that whole circle. The next important is the team. Somebody said team. Take care of your team. Give them the expectations of taking care of your customers and you'll never need the bullet. You'll never run out of food. <laughs> there will be no <laughs> desert island. So that's a really, really important slide. And here's the six keys to a winning team. So the first one is strong leadership. Not strong management, strong leadership. They have to know that they're going someplace, that the company is going someplace. Make sure that you've got a vision that's really clear. Common goal. Do they know what they're working towards? Is it just I have to do this job today or is it our goal for the year is X and gee, these are the cool things that are gonna happen if we achieve that goal. The rules of the game are who does what by when and by when is important. I'm sorry, that's action plan. Action plan is who does what by when. The rules of the game are how do we want people to behave along the way. That goes back to our culture statement, right? So the rules of the game can even be silly things like if I'm not here, the plants get watered. I mean, it can be that simple, 
because if you went on vacation for your first vacation and the team did everything in their job description, but nobody watered the plants, you'd be mad. <laughs> you don't want to come back from vacation mad, right? So the rules of the game are just the silly rules. What time do you come in? Can you, you know, can you wear a beard if you work for us? We had the quiet ones who said, I won't have anybody that has a beard or a tattoo. I just won't. It's my rules. It's my company. If I get big enough that an HR person comes down and says, I have to do it, maybe I'll think about it. But that was his rule, and he made sure everybody bought into that rule before they joined his company. He sold tropical fish. Anyway, <laughs> support, <laughs> support risk-taking. But they would go and like set up tanks, and he said, I don't want people going into other people's homes with a beard and a tattoo. I would be scared. I don't want my clients to be scared. So it was his own phobia, but you own it. You can make the rules. Um, support risk-taking. It's good that they're making mistakes in the pursuit of growing your business. You don't want them to make the same mistake twice, but let them make mistakes because if no mistakes are happening, they're either afraid of you or they're not pushing the envelope. So encourage them to push the envelope and be willing to say it's okay when they make a mistake. And then 100% involvement and inclusion. So it's your job to include everybody in where you're going, but they have to choose to be involved. And in a small business, under 100 people, if they're not being involved voluntarily, if they don't participate and really help you with your business, fire them. And don't be afraid to fire them. You want to hire fast, and hire slow and fire fast. Because Pepsi can afford to have, or Google or Zappos, they can afford to have a bad apple and it gets, but in a small business, you have to have really good people doing what you want or your profitability is gonna go down. And don't be afraid to fire them. I guarantee you there's somebody else. I guarantee you, and they will be better. If a client tells me about a bad employee three times, I don't let them ever tell me again. I say, you have to go fire that person, and if you don't, you, can, you have no longer have the right to bitch to me about them. And every time they didn't, we've either found theft was behind it, or there was some other underlying reason why that employee was not getting involved in the company. One of my clients just about three weeks ago said, you know, she used to be so good, she was spot on, you know, she was, we didn't have anything fall through the cracks and lately she's just, she's not with us. And then about seven days later, I got a phone call saying, you'll never guess what we did today. We were down at the police office, police station. She stole $2,000 in um, cash and another seven by right, she got a hold of their checkbook and was writing checks. How she thought she wasn't going to get caught, but guess what? That's a felony. She's a young mom with little kids. She's now a felon. So 100% involvement and inclusion. And if you have any little gut feeling that somebody is a bad apple and they're not pulling their weight and they're not choosing to be involved, you need to get rid of them. So make sure you have the right people on the bus. With the right people on the bus, you feel like you can go anywhere. I'm living it. Once you have the right people on the bus, you have to have plans for the general manager. Who's going to be able to take the brunt of the responsibility so that you can go to Europe for two days, two months on a, on a cruise with your best friend or whatever? You know, if your best friend won the lottery and said, hey, I want to take you with me and we're going on a whirlwind tour around the world, could you go? Not unless he was going to pay all your bills when you got back because you wouldn't have a company. So what we want to do is plan so that you can have the life. So many business owners take what's left over, and it, many of their employees are making more money than they are. So build the life you want, and then sit down with a, a coach or someone who's done it before, and say, how do I build a business to achieve this life? Because it can be done. It's just sometimes it's a business model change. It has to change up here. So, so much of what we do in business is going on up here and the self-talk we have in our head. Get a general manager, put it on autopilot. Next two levels are synergy and results, and that's when you're gonna take this and dupl duplicate it and multiply it and do have that life you want. Richard Branson said, if, there's, um, if you can run one business successfully, there's no reason you can't run any number of businesses at the same time. The principles are the same. The recipe is the same. 
You know the cool thing about Richard Branson, who I kind of admire? Does he ever look busy? <laughs> How many businesses does he run? He's on a boat or an island in jeans and a white shirt and a blazer, looking chill. So when you're out networking and somebody says, how are you doing? Don't say, oh, I'm so busy. Things are great, I'm so busy. Say, business is running well. The team's taking charge. Are people gonna wanna do business with you if business is running well and the team is really hitting on all cylinders? That's a much better answer to how are things going when you go networking. Do the Richard Branson attitude. <sighs> things are good, the island's chill. <laughs> Anybody ever hear of Jim Rohn? He's a business philosopher. He died just about the time I was becoming a coach. Um, he has a CD called The Art of Exceptional Living. He's got a really weird voice, so if you can put up with his odd um, tone, if you buy that CD, it costs $10, and you email me and say that you listened to it 10 times, I will mail you $10. I will buy it for you. You will be a better human being for having listened to it. Which one? The Art of Exceptional Living. He said, never wish your life were easier, wish you were better. Work harder on yourself than you do on your job. If you work on your job, you will make a living. If you work on yourself, you will make a right. fortune. You will make a fortune. And then this is Brad, and that's a really weird picture. We have to get a higher res picture. Where you'll be in five years will depend on the books you read, the people you associate with, and the actions you take. So 0% of you will take action and achieve what can be achieved without getting the recipe. Come talk to us about the recipe. So right now you can say, I'm going to improve my business on my own. This was great. I took fabulous notes, and I'm off and running. Or you can say, I want to get massive results in my business. And your options are many. The first one that I recommend is a complimentary strategy session. You can do, we do workshops, we have one-on-one -on -one coaching, we do book clubs, we do group coaching. There's something for everyone. That's actually a growth club event we had right before Christmas at the Kempton, but now we've moved to Grayland just because there's more space and it's easier to park. Um, but next time, think about becoming one of those folks. And, um, that's the end of our presentation. I'm going to ask you on the...